Coming up on Nebraska Stories, a combat nurse recounts her memories of war, growing an extra row for those in need, the timeless art of taxidermy, and a college basketball team takes the court for the final time. Stop by Cheryl Fila's home in rural North Bend during harvest, and you'll likely see her busily preparing a hearty lunch for her family and their hired hands. This is when he came and worked on the comic, okay. and that's how he charged it out. Okay. Or working with her daughter-in-law on the books for their farm. Okay, so this one, push down. There you go. You may even catch her with some of her most favorite little people, her grandchildren. These are just some of the many things Cheryl now enjoys after retiring from a successful nursing career that began a long time ago in a place very far away from home. It was getting towards my senior year. I was running out of money. You know, you went to school year round, so you really didn't have the opportunity to get a job and get some money to continue your schooling. Well, at that time, things were pretty pretty heavy in Vietnam. Uh, a lot of fighting, a lot of, a lot of need for nurses. In 1966, Cheryl was entering her final year at St. Elizabeth's School of Nursing in Lincoln when she and four other young women went to a recruiter's office to enlist. In return for paying for her senior year, Cheryl committed to two years of nursing duty in the United States Army. After graduation, Cheryl went to basic training in Texas. Upon completion, she was assigned to an Army hospital in Alabama. Six months later, 21-year-old Second Lieutenant Cheryl Thurber would be in Vietnam, 55 miles from the demilitarized zone. The year was 1968. I was uh, actually assigned to the emergency room. And so with that came four to six corpsmen and two interpreters, and we relied heavily on them. Chulai Air Base was located on the coast of the South China Sea. Cheryl was assigned to the 27th Surgical Hospital, where she assisted with triage and minor surgery. Our day usually went with either the ambulatory would come in or the people from the village. No matter where you were, if you heard helicopters coming in, Everybody went to their stations because you knew things were gonna happen. On a heavy day, they would land, you would go out, you get the patient, you bring him in, he took off, another one would come in. And they would maybe be as full as they could possibly be and still take off. If you were wounded and you made it to the ER, your chances of survival were pretty good. So the helicopters were a big part of getting these fellows back to us. When the wounded poured in, identifying them was often a complicated process. Somebody would come from medical records to take names, and they would have dog tags, the guys, but we didn't always rely on those because the VC uh, and the Viet Cong liked to switch those around. So those who could answer, we would get their names and stuff. If they couldn't answer, if we couldn't get anything, then they were marked with a number, either on the face or the shoulder, somewhere where they would be identified, and the paperwork would go with them. The thing that I remember about these guys the most is that most of them just wanted to be patched up so they could go back out. You know, they had their comrades back there that they all had each other's back. They were, you, you know, they relied on each other, and their, their big thing was, um, I gotta get back. Sometimes they could, sometimes they couldn't. Cheryl found that providing immediate medical care sometimes included small comforts. So many of the guys would come in and the first thing they'd want was a cigarette. So I kept cigarettes and a lighter with me. And one of the gentlemen that came in, uh, a young man, he had lost his lighter. And so I said, well, here, you take mine and I'll just go to the PX and get another one. 
So he did, he took it, and it was a couple of months later, this young man showed up in the ER, and it was this, this kid, and he came to return my lighter. But not all servicemen survived. A morgue sat near the hospital, and when the ER was empty, Cheryl helped identify the dead. The hard part was when the helicopters would come in later with the body bags. There was just one time, I remember I was with the doctor, and we opened up a body bag, and this, this soldier looked intact. You know, he looked, he looked fine until you went to lift his head. You did, you did your best. You did what you could. You know, <clears throat> you, could, you can't do more than that. You can't do more than what you're actually able to do. And you have to come to grips with that. And I think once you come to grips with that, it's not that you like it, but you have to accept it. Cheryl herself was in harm's way. Chulai was a major military air base and was regularly targeted by the Viet Cong. There was always a threat uh, that something would happen. And in fact, there was a nurse in Chulai that died she died after I was there from shelling that came into her ward. But for the most part, I didn't really feel unsafe because the soldiers all kept their weapons. We had barrels outside of the wards filled with sand, but we had like all kinds of guys around us with weapons and we would end up in the bunker, you know. So I never really felt like I personally had to defend myself. I felt taken care of. Working a 12-hour shift nearly every day of her year-long tour, there wasn't much downtime. But when she could, Cheryl would spend time on the beach. It was very serene there. You know, you could lay on the beach, soak up a little sun, get in the water. When you got there, uh, you basically were in another world. Every once in a while, you'd hear the helicopters come in. And the helicopters that came in towards evening, you appreciated because they came in and they, they fired into the water to keep the sharks and stuff back. And this is what they told me. I, I took their word for it. I don't know. I didn't see any sharks. Cheryl's tour came to an end in 1969. When she returned to Nebraska to continue her nursing career, she found herself on a steep learning curve. My biggest adjustment, I think, was the medications were all different. Everything had changed. I mean, they weren't all different, but they had had such advancements in pharmacy, such advancements in technical uh, use of equipment. As her life moved forward, Cheryl's memories of Vietnam faded to the background. She married, had children, and helped her husband grow their farm all while working as a nurse. Her quiet and gentle manner makes it seem impossible that this nurse, mother, and farmer's wife experienced the darker side of human nature. I didn't talk about it at all for probably 20 years. Even my folks didn't ask. Well, my dad had been a World War II veteran, so I think he knew enough not to ask. When my oldest daughter was a junior or senior in high school and they found out locally I'd been in the service. So they had asked me to speak to her class in a history class and I said that I would. And so I went and I told them a little bit about it. You know, it was a short synopsis. And she came home and she says, how come you never told me, you know? And I said, well, it just was never brought up. Among the statues at the Veterans Memorial Park located in North Bend, Nebraska, stands a bronze sculpture of a young woman in uniform. Resolute in posture, she stands with her brothers in arms, ready to answer the call to duty. Well, it needed to be done. Who was going to do it? You know, if you didn't volunteer to go over and take care of these people, who was going to do it? Fighting for the right thing. That's simply.
In a nutshell, what we do is we act as the bridge between producers like farmers, community gardens, even small gardens. We're their bridge to uh, donation agencies such as the Food Bank, Food Net, uh, the Gathering Place, any type of a uh, free distribution center for individuals experiencing hunger. Connecting with produce from the heart uh, really gives us a chance to provide resources and just make more connections with people. Um, so we might know the food pantries or we might know, say, the backyard farmer garden who needs to get their produce somewhere. They just don't know how to do it. And so that's how you bring in produce from the heart. And what's really cool is that we can grow the produce, then NEP can come in and actually give really good recommendations on how to use that produce that we are growing. And having produce from the heart work with us and to pick up that produce and take it to where it's really needed has been a great benefit. If anything, it's that perfect storm period right now for this type of an organization that we have people who want to donate, we have people who want to uh, help uh, collect that produce, we have people who want to help deliver it uh, to places in need, and unfortunately we have a lot of people who need it. is at a food bank each day helping distribute or bringing in produce. If he's not doing that, then he's probably on a weekend going to a farm, picking up all that extra produce and taking it where it needs to go. Mike brings to the table the knowledge of that food pantry, which we never really actually had. So he knows who needs it, what they need, and it's um, much more beneficial for us to know that it's actually going to where it will be wanted communicating to the farmers that you don't have to throw it away anymore. There is an organization that work with us will find a way to make sure that we can get it to someone who needs it. Growing an extra row uh, is always a good idea. If you have extra produce, and we all do, those of us who have gardens, so bringing that into the backyard farmer garden on Tuesday nights or Saturday mornings, so that can be taken to people who can eat it. I think, you know, backyard farmer is 65 years old this year, and it's kind of a great way to celebrate, knowing that we're helping them. They're growing the best produce they possibly can. They're growing in abundance, and having um, NEP, SNAP-Ed, and Produce from the Heart, it, it does just completely align. I mean, they teach people how to take that produce that we are growing, how to use it, what great nutritional values that has, and then having Produce from the Heart being able to actually distribute that to the local areas has just, it, it's kind of the stars all aligned the right way. That relationship that we have with clients and with recipients is, is really strong and, and really, like I said, it, it keeps most of us going. It was funny, yesterday I had a school group come. I asked them if they knew the definition of taxidermy, and most people think it is to, to stuff an animal, and there's really no stuffing involved. Do you know what a taxi cab's purpose is? So it is to move people. Taxi means to move, and so dermy, I said, dermy is short for a word that you are covered with this. So one of them said, oh yeah, epidermis. The definition of my trade is to move skin. Let's open that. Buffalo WrestleMania 101. Todd Cranow is a master taxidermist. He is currently creating a museum quality bison mount and habitat scene for the Crane Trust Nature and Visitor Center. Okay, so now this point. I get excited about tax to me. I'm excited about every piece I do. It's creating nature and God's creation. Some people might think, my gosh, how can you do that every day, you know? But every piece you do is now rewarding that you've brought it back to life, you know. It's just not discarded. Somebody's now going to get to enjoy this. In his workshop on Main Street in Blue Hill, 
Todd gives dead skins the illusion of life. So far, what's good is the length is good. Creating faithful, authentic representations of mammals and birds from around the world. Spain and Argentina and Madagascar and New Caledonia. Taxidermy is a blend of several different study groups or talents. You need to be artistically talented first. Let's just let this roll all the way. Maybe. And then you have to be able to understand anatomy and movement of body muscle structures and bone movements. That all kind of ties in with science and understanding the structure of an animal and their habits. Right there. Years ago was the stiff, musty moose head that was just poking out of the wall. This changed to be more artistic. Todd's work has earned him several prestigious awards, including the highest achievement in his field, the Carl Akeley Award for the most artistic mount in the world show. So we were able to start making something that looked like a battle taking place between a, a boar and a rattlesnake. Lo and behold, at the awards banquet, I win best in the world. It was very emotional, you know, because you put a lot of work into things. In taxidermy, you can always be as good as your reference. To create lifelike taxidermy mounts, Todd has to get every detail just right. But his shoulder hump just keeps going down, 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 where ours is real flat backed. We just gotta get more muscle on here. So this, there's a bone structure on here, his hip bone. So that probably would be the same, but we need more muscle on here, so we're gonna end up pouring foam all around on that. The art of taxidermy begins with modeling. Todd uses a prefab polyurethane mannequin which he alters to match the dimensions of the height he's mounting. In a bison, what's intriguing to me is their, their massive size. We don't want to mount one that's smaller than what it should be. They're such a regal-looking animal. We want to captivate some of the muscle structure. For this bison, Todd adjusts the neck and skull, adds definition to muscles, okay, we'll get that sucker right there like that. and girth to the body with a polyurethane foam that he molds carves and sands until the form fits the skin. Some of their hair is so long on these things, you can't see the finer details of their muscle tone in their hips and the tendons in their legs and things of that nature. And we've rebuilt all those on the mannequins. They're not afraid of much. And you want to portray that, that they're like the, the king of the hill. This is its left eye. The eyes are, I think, very important. We'll study that picture and we think, okay, and how, what kind of clay work do we need to do? And they kind of see the shapes of where the clay is. Okay, now we've got to find the opening. Once the skin is moved into place, the stitching process begins. It's important to hide the seams so as not to betray the illusion of life. There's a lot of sewing. If I would have known when I looked into taxidermy how much sewing there was, I probably maybe would have done it. The fine details on the face are key to creating a lifelike mount. The high tanning process removes texture and color from the nose pad, so Todd builds it up again with dots of glue. And it all is the finest detail. That's a piece of pink paper. You might not ever see it like that, but some people might. If the lighting is right in that building, someone will go, oh, look at that, you can see the veins in its nose. The wetness of its nose or the angle of his eyelashes, so all those little details really a good artist, you stand back and you can really see what they're trying to, to portray. I don't know who's gonna look under there, but we want it looking good when they do. On the day the bison arrived at the Crane Trust, excitement was in the air. When they open the door, that, that's one of the things they will see across the room is this thing kind of staring at the doorway when they walk in. I'm hopefully they was like, oh my gosh, look how big those things are. And well, he's looking right over here. You know, he's, he was waiting for us to come through the door almost. He's finally found his final destination, his home now. We're just not patient enough. And what's great is we have the double, but what we don't have now is the double screen. Let's go. Perfect. Coach Brandon Rogers is going easy on his team tonight. Here we go, one more time. They've just played four games in five days. 
including trips to Arkansas, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. And the eight-person team is down to seven. One player is sick and injured. For every big money, high profile college sports program, there's a tiny, low profile Grace University. They compete in the National Christian College Athletic Association and have won a few championships. Unlike their major conference neighbors, Grace Athletics doesn't have things like showers with heated floors, lockers with built in iPads, chartered jets to games. The Royals travel in a rented 15 passenger van. So we'll have tomorrow off Friday. Our game's at six. It's a small college that started the season with a new young coach and big dreams. Simple things. Just simple Our goal is to get to regionals. It's never been done since we've joined the Division I and the NCCAA, so we're, we're excited. We're hungry. But a few weeks before games started, this happened. My first reaction was, what? <laughs> what? Like, wait, what? No, like, I was supposed to graduate from here. Or I'm supposed to have, like, my four years of basketball here. Obviously, that hit us all very out of the blue, and none of us expected that by any means. Blaming low enrollment and financial challenges, Grace decided to shut down after this school year. Some days are hard, and it's, man, like, this really sucks. Like, what am I going to do next year? And helping each other through that, and then some days you joke about it, like, oh, our school is closing, like, what is going on, you know, and we make light of it. You know, like, Coach will park in two parking spots with our van on trips and be like, oh, it's okay, our school's closing. It is dark humor, very dark humor. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about it, but most of the time they're just college kids having fun and playing a game they love. Playing with a sense of responsibility to leave a lasting memory of Grace Athletics because now they're the only team left on campus. Sean Cleaver was men's basketball coach at Grace, but he never had a team this year. For various reasons, closure led to canceling the men's season. So instead of leading a team he felt could compete for a national championship in another year, he's teaching a couple of classes and finding new homes for his players. Because I felt like there's one last thing I can do for my guys, and that's help them get placed at another school. Cleaver played ball here. He coached the women's team for a while. His parents met here. Relatives went here when the school started in 1943. Now he and a couple other athletic staffers are doing something they've never done, trying to figure out how you end an athletic program. Everybody wonders that because this is a first for everybody. You know, how do you close a school? How do you close a program? And we are figuring it out as we go because nobody's ever done this before. People are signing up. We're giving out uh, old uniforms, basketballs and whatnot, just so people can have a piece of grace that they, so they can remember it in a positive way. It is very sad, and it hits me at, at uh, random moments. She doesn't have eyes in the back of her head, so if you have a seal, she'll at least know a wraparound pass is there. Rogers and his Royals know more about their next game, their next opponent, than they do about next year. Good job, there we go. And they're okay with that. For now, they're making the most of a tough situation. We gotta be patient. Let's get both of those looks as much as we can. The rescreen is something It's we've something done. incredible because everyone's fighting for something right now. You know what I mean? We're fighting for next year, the unknown. We don't know what it is, but we all are doing it together. We're gonna go over Omaha first. All right, let me give me that five out here. There's nothing we can do to change this. Just enjoy the time we have now. God is good. I know that he has a plan for it, and he's going to take care of all of us. There we go. It's definitely brought us closer together, and now we really take every game to heart. Before, we were all really looking forward to next season, and oh yeah, this season is great, but next season will be even better, and now there is no next season. What we have built this year has been absolutely unbelievable. Um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Every one of you on this team 
are incredible human beings. I mean, you guys have so much to do in your life, and I can't imagine what you're gonna end up doing in your life. Yeah, let's go play. <laughs> on three. One, two, three. Family! And Lord, I want to worship you for the last 50 years of athletics, for the last 75 years of Grace University's mission. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final home game here at Grace University. Good job, good job. Omaha! And we have a good shot, take it. You guys are hitting, we're fine. We just need to have patience. That last shot was something coming down the shot clock. We need a good swing off of Omaha. We need something instead of an ISO play. Everyone scored tonight. That was so cool. Good. <laughs> oh, <I'm> so sorry. <laughs> okay, one more time, one more time. It's coming to an end, and it's it's the hit reality, I guess, a reality hit today. Thank you so much. Ended on a bang. Super proud about that. Oh, this is it. <laughs> this is the last time. And it's my last season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's been fun. I wouldn't want to end it any other way. Okay. To see more Nebraska stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund.